its way into our beloved DSLRs. This idea that because we have a um, supercomputer that can do seven trillion operations per second that we're using to take pictures with, that is allowing us to do a dramatic, uh, uh, dramatic amount of things that would not be possible in a traditional photographic uh, environment. And this is based upon both something called machine learning, where the different applications, including the cameras, are taught what the world is so they can see it and understand it, both its depth and its composition, its subject matter. And then um, also artificial intelligence, where it's actually using that information and then trying to calculate um, what we want, what we would like in terms of an optimized image. So the both weeks are going to be talking about that. This one, we're going to start off talking about um, shooting. And so um, this right here is that outline. So for those of you who just uh, came in, I recommended doing a screenshot. Um, I'll share these with Karen and she can post them onto the uh, Facebook page for you all to grab. Um, but I thought just so you have it here, this is kind of the outline of what uh, some of the stuff I'm going to be deal dealing with tonight. The other thing that I have is these are some of the um, applications that I'll be sharing with. Mostly tonight is just going to be the native camera and Lightroom. I'm going to talk about some of these other ones, but this will be more related to next week but I wanted to share with you these um, icons of the apps. Um, in case you wanted to download them during the week, don't pay for any of them. If any of them have subscriptions, just use the free version. But um, there's some really fun stuff, especially related to artificial intelligence and machine learning. So um, if you wanna take a screenshot of this, as well as the screenshot related to the previous one, please, Go right ahead and do that. Also, and again, if you want to turn off your cameras and your microphones, then that'll open up, I think, a little bit more screen real estate for what we'll be sharing. Okay, so the first thing that is on that list is kind of four areas that I want to show some samples of um, related to the capabilities of the, the current mobile phones. And those areas are um, the color, tone, and detail, the dynamic range of what we are able to capture with these. Uh, then we're going to talk about this idea of uh, capturing um, motion, both freezing it and letting it float with things like long exposure. Then we'll have uh, some samples related to zoom range, uh, panoramas, our basic field of view. Obviously, with these new, you know, little cameras here. You know, how in the world do we get a significant telephoto um, or a dramatic wide angle with something where the um, sensor is literally smaller than your fingernail? So um, that will be one of the topics uh, in terms of our um, zoom range. And then the topic of uh, depth of field, uh, imitating the shallow depth of field that really um, has been the main thing that has separated the what I call big boy cameras, big girl cameras from our point and shoots. Uh, we've had cameras of all different sorts for a million years. And it's always been the consumer point and shoot camera that um, has not had the capability of shooting the shallow depth of field. And of course, for us photographers, that's one of the main things that we have for telling a story is being able to separate our subject matter from our background using an open f-stop in order to create this, this uh, exaggerated depth. And that is one of the things that this computational photography is allowing, even with something that doesn't have a variable f-stop uh, built into it. As no smartphone does, there is no variable f-stop in any of these devices. So with that in mind, uh, I think what I'm gonna do is rather than go through and for time's sake, um, this, I'm in my camera roll, I'm on an iPhone, I'm going to click on the um, share icon, which you all know that little teeny um, up arrow. And with that, you've got the ability to come up here and say slideshow. So I'm going to say slideshow. And you can adjust your volume to taste. But this is just going to go through this uh, idea. Sorry, let me, that should be there shouldn't be any little notes, but you're going to get little teeny references. I'm in, 
I'm in do not disturb mode, but it's still disturbing. So what we're looking at here for the next uh, minute or so is going to be this idea of huge dynamic um, vistas by things like panoramas, as well as zoomed in telephotos, both using the optical zoom and the digital zoom. So again, I'm just wanna, for speed's sake, I'll share some uh, samples in this uh, slideshow. If it will do that. So here, these are from Hawaii, East Coast. Uh, some of them are being cropped. We've got Australia and Russia, but basically it's just showing this ability to look directly into the sun, directly away from the sun and still maintain a full tonal range. Um, from my standpoint, the subtleties of black and white, um, purposely keeping this misty, foggy, uh, feeling in different shots. You will notice that my images tend to be a little bit on the hot side, meaning I do like my saturation. And uh, so again, there's a digital zoom. Fog. And then we've got some before and afters here. So actually, let me a few of the, the before and afters, let me just do that, where I've shot them specifically flat, but, uh, and then have um, enhanced them, taking advantage of the fact that we do have raw images on the iPhone. So Grand Canyon before and after tweaked. Again, misty morning on the North shore of Molokai and what we're able to pull out by taking advantage of the raw file format. This is something that is incredibly exciting because if you've ever shot directly into the sun, this isn't an HDR shot. I just shot it in raw and then took advantage of the fact that that much dynamic range was still in the foreground, even though I was exposing for the sky. Same thing here, exposing for my foreground, but all that information is still in the sky. So this idea that we now have access to uh, raw um, data is incredible, especially now with what we're going to be talking about tonight, this brand new raw file format called Apple uh, Pro HDR, uh, Pro, uh, Pro Raw, Apple Pro Raw is really is a groundbreaking new flavor of Adobe's DNG file format. But um, what it's able to do and maintain the flexibility of a raw file, yes, that's a kimono dragon. And here we are in Angkor Wat, the subtleties of a smoke-filled Buddhist temple. You get the idea. So this, these are related to what kind of tonal range is now available within these files, especially when shooting in RAW. None of these are with the, the current pictures that I'm showing are with the 12. So they're not taking advantage of Apple Pro RAW. These are just taking advantage of shooting while within Lightroom Mobile and uh, its way of capturing RAW. Some of these are not even RAW. This is a vertical pano in um, St. Peter's uh, Cathedral in St. Petersburg. So you get the general idea of what the subtlety that we're able to pull out of these files. Speaking of those cruise lines that Karen mentioned, I do teach for both um, National Geographic Lindblad expeditions as well as for Crystal Cruises. That's presupposing that we ever get back on a cruise ship again, thanks to our beloved COVID. Okay, so um, there are some things just related to the dynamic range of these um, smart devices. 
The other thing that we have is this idea that I wanted to share about was motion. And the great thing about um, these cameras is that they um, often have a burst mode and the iPhone has a 10 frame per second full resolution burst mode built into it. It's now the, um, you can turn it on. It was turned off for a while on the iPhone. The up shutter release um, can be used as a burst mode trigger on uh, the iPhone. But the other thing to uh, keep in mind, and this isn't just related to smartphones, but on any sort of camera that's allowing you to shoot video, remember that when you're shooting 4K video, you are shooting eight megapixel stills. And so um, a great way, if you're doing something where you need the money shot and the uh, capturing of the, mo of the moment is more important than anything else, remember you can always shoot video and then do a frame grab of that. The other thing related to motion, one of the things that's great is this ability to do uh, time-lapse uh, video on the iPhone. Um, this is an older one. We're getting a little bit of wiggle in here, um, but I have it on a movable tripod head. And so that's why it's panning across the scene. The nice thing related to the brand new um, iPhones, the uh, 12s, any of the 12 flavors, is the ability to not only do time lapse, but to do uh, night mode time lapse, where it will shoot up to 10 seconds uh, per frame and then stitch those all together into a time lapse. So the proverbial stars coming across the sky. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about panoramas, I mean, uh, time lapse. Uh, later on. There's also a something that's been built into the iPhones for a long time called live photos. You've probably stumbled into them. It's the cute little thing where you can make a little video clip or you've panned through your images and you just happen to see a little motion accidentally and you don't know what that's for. The nice thing about the um, live photos is that they can be used to create long exposures. And not only traditional long exposures where you're just leaving the, um, the exposure or the shutter open for umpteen seconds, but what it does is it actually grabs um, hundreds of images and each one of those is razor sharp and then it aligns each one of those hundred photographs, let's say, and anything that wasn't moving in any significant way, in this case, the background of this building um, is razor sharp and then the movement is exaggerated by the blending of these hundred different exposures. So something that would normally never be done without a tripod, this is a handheld three second exposure with razor sharp backgrounds, um, is fantastic. The other thing that is great about the live photos is as you take a picture with the live photo, these, the hundred pictures that it's actually taking during the process, you can actually go back and reframe it. So if you didn't quite get the perfect moment of a shot, you can change what's known as the keyframe and therefore get it. So there are benefits to shooting in live photo, though that's not a good default. This is using some after software to uh, muck about with a still image to make it look like it's a slow motion um, video. This is actually, it's just a single shot from the North Shore of Molokai. When we get into talking about um, third-party apps used to uh, enhance images, that's when we'll get into things like that last shot. And again, this idea of being able to uh, either shoot in burst mode or um, do a frame grab from live video. This is one of those live photos. Instead of using it as a long exposure, I simply asked it to loop. So the palm trees are razor sharp, but the foreground with the movement is still there. Or it could be something as simple as this, where the little lapping of the waves is left in motion. This is what's technically known as a cinegraph. The vast majority of the scene is razor sharp. There's no movement because it automatically aligned the umpteen uh, different exposures, leaving behind what it sensed as motion. Okay, so you get the idea in terms of motion and uh, what is what you're able to do. 
I love um, shooting motion blur where I'm intentionally panning with a subject, usually in the passenger seat of a car looking out the window. And that's another thing that's possible either through a true long exposure or using one of these methods like live photos to uh, allow portions of a scene to um, blur while other portions stay razor sharp. And that's basically where I'm syncing up. I'm following that particular tree as I go by in a moving car. If you've never done what are called drive-bys, I highly recommend it. It's fantastic. Set your shutter speed to like a 30th of a second and just shoot 10 million shots. And uh, every so often one will come up like this and uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. These are the long exposures where you're taking that live photo and then uh, asking it to uh, automatically align everything but the motion. These are in Great Falls, Virginia. And again, another cinegraph here where it automatically aligned everything handheld, no tripod. Here I'm letting it become a little video clip. And here's the exact same one, just allowing the motion to blur. And here is it in color. Okay, so you get the, the general idea, all sorts of things that you can do with freezing motion or letting it uh, run. Um, the phones are now uh, quite waterproof. The uh, current iPhones are uh, rated to half an hour to 16 feet. Typically, if I'm gonna take it out into the surf, I'll put it in a case, um, but there's a lot to be said for uh, what you're able to get away with with motion. In this case, a nighttime shot, very little light, and the, uh, the bubbles being blown are in motion where the uh, model is sharp. Okay. Um, zoom range. Uh, Singapore, the ultra wide is a 13 millimeter. The default uh, lenses on the iPhone are 13 for an ultra wide if you have the three lenses. Um, 26 is the standard uh, wide, that's the main camera. And then on every iPhone, aside from the 12 Pro Max, it's a 55 millimeter telephoto lens on the new um, iPhone 12 Pro Max. It is a 65 millimeter, which is nicer for um, shooting telephoto. What this allows is by having a 13 millimeter wide lens, this is a great shot on Singapore. And then being able to look out to see at all the ships waiting to come into port. Okay, this would be using the digital zoom, not one of the optical zooms. And okay, that's definitely is a digital zoom. But it's pretty amazing what you can get out of these. Here, where I live in San Diego, if you look really closely, you can see a sandcastle on the beach right there. And that is that that's in the center of the screen. So standing in the exact same place, it's not perfect. This is again, this is using the digital zoom, but when you just have your one camera with you in your pocket, it's pretty darn cool that you're able to get this sort of shot, pull back a little bit to get the sunset and then pull back even wider to get the entire field. Again, this was all taken last night, super wide angle telling the entire story of North San Diego here. And this is that uh, series of cliffs in the distance, way over here, using the zoom built into the iPhone. So panos, one of the things that I love, both vertical and horizontal panos, is the storytelling options that you have by taking advantage of them. And uh, for those of you who remember the olden days of uh, real panorama cameras that actually took it in one fell swoop with one piece of film, or probably most of you have been doing individual shots and then stitching them together in Photoshop or Lightroom, the ability to do something like this where you're looking directly into the sun and then directly away from the sun on a moving subject and getting a consistent exposure should be illegal, should just be absolutely illegal. And again, that's the benefit of 
these um, smart devices. Nighttime panos, back into the canyon, back onto Molokai. You get the idea. Uh, motion, normally you can't do a panorama that would able to uh, capture something like a moving wave without some sort of staccato where you would have, you know, slice, 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 slice. And this is able to move fast enough in a capture to actually get consistency even with something as dynamic as breaking waves. Okay, so you're getting the idea in terms of the range um, that's possible with panoramas down in Patagonia. It's kind of ridiculous to, to shoot with your smartphone. I had, of course, all my DSLRs with me down in Patagonia teaching for geographic, but uh, I couldn't have got this with my you know, big boy camera in the same way. And one of the things we'll be talking about tonight is um, infrared and uh, you'll see some samples of that. Again, just you get the idea. Okay, and last in terms of samples is our um, depth of field and this ability to imitate a shallow depth of field, whether for traditional portraits or for still lives has been the holy grail of digital photography when it comes to these tiny little cameras, whether it's a point and shoot camera or whether it's a smartphone, this ability to isolate the subject and remove distractions is essential um, for us to be you know, happy with our photography, to be able to tell the story that's inside of us. And what's uh, able to be done now, especially with the new iPhones that are now using what's known as LiDAR technology, uh, light detection and ranging on the um, 12 Pros has made it even better, this ability to create these shallow depth effects that would normally be uh, only be able to be done on a very fast piece of glass, our traditional, you know, F1812, you get the idea. So, uh, and of course you can, the great thing is with this fixed um, f-stop, if you don't want the shallow depth of field, as a default, you simply can hit a button and say, I don't want. It may have been taken with a portrait mode, but there's nothing stopping you from not taking advantage of that. You have both options right there at your disposal. Okay, and then last but not least, the uh, just a few infrared samples. One of the things that I'm so excited about with these new devices is this ability to shoot in the infrared portion of the invisible spectrum. Traditionally, this has not been possible with anything but a, a dedicated converted camera to infrared because all cameras have an infrared inhibitor built into them, what's known as a hot mirror. And so if you were to put a normal infrared filter in front of a, a camera, you would not be getting anything. Um, or at least not without a long, long exposure. These are handheld shots taking advantage of the night mode. These are on the iPhone 11. And now with the iPhone 12, with the new uh, Apple Pro Raw, you're able to get even more um, dynamic range and more traditional feel of infrareds, um, even on a bloody pocket phone. So we're gonna, touch more about this and we'll talk about um, editing and enhancing infrared shots uh, as we get into next week as well. Okay. So, and that's what the shot looks like and then we'll be tweaking them. Okay, so just some samples there. Um, file format, the thing that I just wanna uh, mention and this for this, let's actually go into our settings so here, here are my, is my uh, desktop for my iPhone. In the upper right-hand corner, we have settings. And I'm gonna come down to two main ones is what I wanna cover here. Continuing down when we start getting into where it starts with music and TV, you have photos and camera. So I'm gonna start with camera and I'm gonna talk about a few different things here that are uh, pertinent to um, your shooting options. 
First off, um, if you have um, any of the last three versions of the iPhone um, 10, 11, or 12, you can have this ability to shoot in what they call high efficiency mode. And high efficiency is what is, as you can see here, HEIF or HEVC, sometimes known as HEIC as well, high efficiency file format. And it is um, not a JPEG. Um, it is, excuse me, Apple's own format, as you probably are familiar with. JPEG was originally created for pie charts on bar charts, you know, 30 years ago. It had nothing to do with photography and really should not be used for photography. So Apple came up with this um, new file format, HEIF, HEVC -E -E is for video. And it's about half the size of JPEG, which is great, but it's also 10 bits per channel, not the traditional 8 bit per channel of a JPEG. It also is using what's known as a P3 color space, not an sRGB. So again, it's getting a little geeky, but you've got a greater dynamic range in terms of what's being grabbed. You have better compression in terms of maintaining detail, and you're at half the file size of a traditional JPEG. The thing is here, why would you then use most compatible if you are going back and forth and you need JPEGs, you need to send a JPEG out to somebody immediately, then you may want to use most compatible for those times. If you are, again, doing something related to time sensitive news media, that may be important. I'll talk about how you can convert it um, automatically on the fly. So Typically, I'm still going to leave it in high efficiency. If you do have one of the new iPhone 12 Pros, you will have this new option, the Apple Pro RAW. And again, this is 12 bits of information per channel. If you're familiar with that little geeky thing, I'll just throw it out there. A JPEG is eight bits of information per red, green, and blue channel. It's two to the eighth power or 256 shades of red, green, and blue. That's all there is when you shoot JPEG, 256 shades of red, green, and blue. You times those times each other, 256 times 256 by 256, you get 16 million. And that's why we can actually you know, reproduce photographs for the JPEG. But you'll run out of that once you start processing. You run out of colors. Your blues and reds and, and greens will all have a very limited dynamic range. By updating it from eight bits to 12 bits of information per channel, you now have 4,000 shades of red, 4,000 shades of green, 4,000 shades of blue, 4,000 times 4,000 times 4,000, as we all know is, class, just kind of spat it out, I'm doing it in your head, is 60 billion potential tones versus 16 million. So being able to shoot in a raw file format um, especially this file format is fantastic. The great thing that is about the Apple Pro RAW is it takes everything that it's been doing with computational photography, specifically what they call deep fusion and smart HDR, and it saves that as part of the raw metadata. Um, deep fusion, when you shoot a photograph, a standard high contrast photograph outdoors in the iPhone, it may take up to nine photographs for both tonal range and detail and sharpness for different portions of the image. All nine of those shots are saved as part of the Apple Pro RAW file format. Same thing with its Smart HDR. Smart HDR is automatically not only shooting, say, three bracketed shots, but it's purposely saying, I'm going to do the underexposed one for the sky and the overexposed one for the shadow foreground. In other words, it will automatically slice up the HDR for you and put it into the appropriate area in that photograph. That is also saved as part of the Apple Pro RAW file format. That is what is known as bitchin'. That is just gosh darn bitchin'. And that's what is groundbreaking about this new RAW file format from Apple. It is only available on the 12 Pros. So there you go. There's that limitation. You still have regular RAW and you have an HDR RAW that's built into the Lightroom mobile camera. And we'll talk about that in a bit. 
So anyway, so in terms of file formats, I'm going to recommend that when you're shooting normally, use high efficiency and Apple Pro RAW, if you've got that as an option, you do need to turn it on here or you will not even find it in the camera on the new iPhone 12 Pros. You have to tell it you want it to be able to shoot in this. A traditional high efficiency image is going to be probably under two megabytes. A Apple Pro RAW one is gonna be between 20 and 30 megabytes. All that information does take up space. So I wouldn't leave this on and shoot everything in it. There's no reason to. The normal camera shoots fantastic even without the Pro RAW. But if you're in front of the money shot or you're doing something tricky like night photography or infrared, this is a game changer. Okay. And then we're gonna come over that was format. We won't go into that. There's something here called preserve setting. And I like this because this means it will um, keep it. If you're in portrait mode, you go away and come back, it'll keep it in that mode. If you're using some of the creative filters like uh, noir to do a black and white, then it will keep that. The one thing that I don't keep is exposure adjustment because you, if you're like me, have done some sort of exposure compensation in the past with your big boy, big girl camera, and you forgot about it. And then you ended up doing a whole range of photographs with the inappropriate um, exposure compensation. So I do not let um, that be a sticky adjustment, okay? And this is under the preserve setting mode and preserve setting. And there is your use volume up for burst. So again, you have to turn that on. If not, it will not work. So your volume up to do as a burst, I recommend it. And then also um, your grid down here. No reason not to have a little rule of thirds grid to help you line up horizons and everything else. And uh, I would turn on scene detection it's automatically going to analyze using this machine learning to know exactly what um, it is looking at. You're giving it permission to be a lot more intelligent than it normally would be. You can prioritize faster shooting. That's if you're using that burst mode rather than using all the technology at its disposal and doing a slow burst. If you're purposely pulling down that up volume button, there's no reason you're doing that for a reason because you want to capture this motion going by, the bicyclist is going by in front of the sunset. So you can turn this on, prioritize faster shooting, you'll still get a great shot and it will be a little bit faster. And there's no reason to not take advantage of things like lens correction. It knows what lens you're shooting with, why not have it automatically fix that? And this is the other component of Apple's computational photography, which is their smart HDR. And this is, again, it's the best parts of separate exposures into a single one. So it is intelligent enough in concert with that um, scene detection to not only do your bracketed exposures, not only combine them, but do it based upon the subject matter of your shot. Okay, that is camera. And then in photos, the one thing that I would um, put in here is something to keep in mind because you're able to shoot in this ridiculously high dynamic range, um, you don't necessarily see it. And the problem is, is that I would recommend turning this on so you can see what you're actually grabbing. And um, in the settings under photos, view full HDR, the monitors on these devices are, have a wide enough gamut, reproducible range of colors for the device has a wide enough gamut to show it, just keep in mind, there'll be some times that you will share one of your images off, off the device to a screen that does not have that long, uh, that wide of a gamut of reproducible range of colors. And if you've seen that before, if you've done that, where you kind of go, all of a sudden my highlights of my sunset got a little muddy, that's the reason why. The image is still beautiful, you have all the tone there, but you are viewing it on a device that does not support this full HDR. You can turn this off. You're dumbing down the image. I'll leave that up to you. I just wanted to make sure that you saw that there. And last, under settings within photos, transfer to Mac or PC. This has to do with that um, high efficiency, that compatibility. 
if you have automatic turned on and you send an image, it will go to that device and says, oh, you're sending it to a desktop Macintosh, but it's not running the latest operating system. So I'm going to automatically convert that to a JPEG. You're sending it to an Android phone via text. It says, ah, I know that the Android is not gonna be supporting the HEIC yet. Um, everybody will be supporting the HEIC and the HEIF um, just because it's so great and it's an open file format. It's not proprietary to Apple. They just open it up to everybody. So this will automatically go look to wherever you're sending something and change it as needed. If you absolutely positively don't want it changed no matter what, you can say keep original and then it will sell, it will send things like the HEIC even if it's not compatible on the other end. Up to you, I leave the automatic on as a default. Okay, there we go. There are some settings up. We set up our camera. We talked about photos, computational photography. Let's talk a little bit about the um, the um, things that came in with these latest iPhone 12s. And specifically, uh, probably I won't go through this kind of slideshow. You can, all of this stuff is available on the Apple uh, website that was part of their keynote address for the um, iPhone 12 launch, where you find things like 11 trillion, I had seven, 11 trillion operations per second for these new iPhones. All these new capabilities that are built into it Basically, I just want to mention, and I've mentioned two of them already, um, the Smart HDR, which is automatically grabbing your uh, different portions of the image and doing bracketed exposures and combining those. Deep Fusion, which is kind of going a little bit further, its emphasis is on uh, tone range and also detail, where it automatically finds skin tone versus cloth versus uh, foliage and will actually shoot different um, amounts of sharpness based upon the subject matter, and then it will combine those together. Again, up to uh, nine different shots in there. And let's see if we've got a little sample for those of you who don't remember our little keynote. So again, it's automatically doing these multiple shots and then also creating a depth map and subject map based upon the um, different elements within the scene. So between Deep Fusion and Smart HDR, we've got just a huge amount of horsepower behind the, uh, the shooting of these images. The other thing is with these um, multi-lens iPhones, if you have any of the current ones, they are either using the two different views from those two different uh, lenses to create a, a depth map to know how far the subject is away from the camera. Or in the case of the new iPhone 12 Pros, it's using this LiDAR, light uh, detection and ranging, which is actually sending out a microscopic laser and um, doing a mapping of the scene based upon that. And its primary use is for augmented reality where you're creating a true map, a 3D map of a scene so you can place fictitious virtual reality images in it. But it also is being used for photography and it is allowing for dramatically better um, focus speeds as well as this edge detection which is giving us our bokeh effects. Okay, so again, LiDAR is a big game changer and uh, expect all the new iPhones after this 12 to have it and it's built into the 12 Pros. Okay, so um, let's uh, take a deep breath. Because that was a lot, I'll keep going at this speed for a month. So um, Karen, if you want to um, open up just a couple minutes for question, so people can kind of chew on that. And then I'm gonna show some videos from the field of um, uh, some techniques. Okay. 
So um, you can turn on your video again. And if you have a question, could you raise your hand? And to do that, um, you should go under participants. Oops. And there, there should be, hmm, I don't see it. Oh, well, you, you know what? They changed on your microphone. You can just speak. We'll just do like three questions. This is more or less a, just a break for. Okay. So um, if you have a question, um, go ahead and uh, talk. And really, I see your hand up there. Um, I have a quick question on the settings under the photos. Um, yeah. What choice would you pick for the storage? Either the optimized iPhone storage or the download and keep originals? Um, I would do the originals. I don't use iCloud. The default setting when you give it permission to use iCloud and you pay for that service is once you start filling up your phone, it uploads all the full resolution files, throws those away off your phone, leaving behind a low resolution stand in. The problem with that is if you're editing a lot, especially on the road when you don't have fast Wi-Fi, you're gonna see that there's a little teeny, you know, wheel that has to take place before you edit every single photograph. So okay. my preference is to not use the um, iCloud setting for storage. Um, if you're using the HEIC, it stores a huge amount of photographs. I would back up on a regular basis. I use an app called iMazing, which is great for backing up. It shows you every single folder on your, on your device. You just plug it on your desktop and you can, you know, back up your Lisbon trip or whatever like that. So if you start running out of space, I would manually back up and free up some space. Um, I would not use that just because you really don't have the full resolution files on your device. If you're on a plane, you can't edit them. It'll, it'll say that this is just a stand in. So anyway, that's my- along, <clears throat> along with that, the only other setting I had a question about was the mirror front camera on the camera setting. There's no reason to have that on, is there? Um, no, I mean, that's a, just a preference and whether you want it to act like a mirror or whether you yeah. want it to, yeah, that's okay. just a preference that you're in. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Terry Jotashi has a question. Terry Jo, oh. you want to unmute yourself? Oh, yes. Hi, Jack. Thank you so much for, for all this. I have a question. Did you say iMazing for transferring? Amazing iMazing is a great desktop app and um, it's right here and uh, it's you, you buy it. It's a desktop. It's not a mobile app, but it knows every one of your devices. You can plug it in or do it via Wi-Fi. It automatically, if you go into your photos, it will show you every album so you can back up a particular album. You can see every photograph. It lets you see every message, every phone, every Anything that you've done will automatically be shown and you can back it up individually. It's a okay, really so amazing tool. That is amazing. So you can, it'll actually transfer your videos also from your phone to your computer? Yes, you can use it as a backup where it does a tra traditional um, iTunes type backup where you can use it to back up and restore. But the nice thing is that I like is that I can come in here and look at all my shared albums and I want to, you know, go to things on Swami's or family, and I can see exactly what's in there and pull out images. So, oh, thank um, you. That's amazing. I've been using image capture, but it never <laughs> pulls over the um, oh, this this videos. Is, yeah, on steroids. Thank you. Okay, well, so um, I've got some videos here, and I wanted to shoot. This is talking about shooting, so um, I wanted to. Uh, be out in the field actually shooting. Uh, I've done this before where I've shot up, I put together a little um, still life, but a still life at night in my little studio is not pretty in relationship to going outside. The problem is that if you're wanting to record the actual um, software that's doing the shooting, like the native camera or Lightroom Mobile, you're needing to use the screen recorder built into the iPhone which is notorious for bad audio. That's on purpose because they don't want you to be able to take anything that's on your screen and then just record it for video because that gets into copyright. You end up being able to record um, all sorts of things. So it ends up using the speaker 
on the iPhone to grab the audio. But as I switch from say shooting with the, um, the rear facing camera, it will use that microphone. And then I use it to the front facing camera and it uses that one. Sometimes I was using a high quality uh, Bluetooth microphone and uh, sometimes it would use that and sometimes it wouldn't. All that to say, that's a big, huge apology out there right now that is um, to say the sound quality on some of these is um, less than optimal. Some of them are, are fine and some of them are not. So I apologize for that to um, begin with. But with that, I believe this first one is going to be talking about setting um, focus and zoom and exposure on the iPhone in case you didn't know how to do that. On setting exposure and zoom and focus on the. So you can set your own audio to the appropriate level that's for your device. So I'm going to switch it over. So we can see the uh, front-facing camera, not the rear-facing selfie camera, and walk through a few of things to remember about shooting. So here, first off, we've got this uh, kind of streamlined interface where we don't have uh, things like exposure, we don't have our timer, we don't have our filter. You can't see it aside from the little key arrow at the very top of the interface. When you tap on that at the bottom, all these options pop up. We'll talk about some of these later. Let me, I'm just going to interject in there because we have these um, screens at the top and I can't, I'm not quite sure what you all are seeing. As an example, when I click on this, can you all see this little teeny arrow right here? Oh, you can. Yeah. Yes. yes. As long as you can see that because it may be covered up by all the different faces here. So if you can see that, that's what we're talking about here. And specifically, that's what I'm saying is that when you click on this, when you're in the native camera on the iPhone, it will open up these different elements here. As a matter of fact, let's, for, for speed's sake, let me, I'm going to walk through it here because the audio will be so much better than what we just were going to have to try and survive through. Does that make sense? Is that okay if I do that? You won't see actual movement, but you'll get the idea. So this little um, carrot here, um, allows, it opens up this kind of tray of different options. Okay. So there's your flash. Um, when we talk about shooting a portrait, remember that even though I'm not in a nighttime situation, you've got a fill flash. Very nice for a, a backlit midday portrait to have mm -hmm. a little fill flash at your disposal. You click on that and you can force it on. As a default, it's auto, meaning it will only come on when it's dark but you can force that. So now you've got a fill flash for daytime portraits. This right here is your live photo um, icon. This is what's gonna allow you to grab um, actually three seconds of video with every photograph. That's what's gonna allow us to do those motion blurs that I showed you or those cinegraphs where a portion of the image is steady and a portion of the image is um, mm -hmm. motion blurred. Um, when you click on that, it will become orange up here. You'll see a little icon and it'll be orange. It means you're shooting in that mode. Um, I don't typically leave that on. If I'm not trying to do some sort of motion effect, I don't recommend leaving it on because what it does is it's constantly shooting video. Every time the camera is open, it is video full time. It shoots three seconds and then throws it away. It shoots three seconds, throws it away. Three seconds, throws it away. So one, it uses up battery more than anything else because it's, it's constantly doing calculations. But two, because what happens is when you press the shutter, it says, oh, you want that picture? And then it goes back to its buffer and it grabs the last second and a half of video prior to you pressing the shutter, which is pretty darn cool. You're actually able to take a picture prior to pressing the shutter. It also takes a second and a half of video after the shutter was pressed. When you press the shutter, it's 12 megapixels. It's a full size image. What happened before and after is actually just 4K video. It's only eight um, megapixels. So it's not quite the quality that you would want in terms of if you want to choose one of those other frames. The other thing is because it's literally shooting hundreds of different frames, it can't use that deep fusion and the smart HDR in the same way if you shot 
without live photo. So if you know you're shooting motion blur, you want to shoot motion blur, by all means, use this mode, click to your heart's content. And I'll show you how you can edit it to get those motion effects. But as a default, leave that turned off. That is why I have that um, preserved settings turned on in the camera. So you don't accidentally turn that on today and it's on for the next three months. Okay, because if you don't have that preserve setting turned on, you can accidentally have this turned on for weeks and you're not taking advantage of these wonderful things like Deep Fusion and Smart HDR. Okay, change your aspect ratio. No reason to do that. That's why God made crop. Here's your exposure compensation. If you want to not dial in exposure compensation, um, this will allow you to uh, do a numeric value. I'll show you the typical way that you would do it. You don't have to do this. I do this when I'm shooting raw, so I know exactly what I'm getting. Also, by definition, when you're shooting raw, you've got this huge dynamic range. And as a default, I found that Apple seems to be underexposing all their raw files to make sure there's no chance of clipping a highlight. And that's just silly. Most of the information in a raw file is in the highlights. Um, by purposely underexposing everything, you're throwing away a huge amount of your tonal range. So as a default, um, when I'm shooting raw, I will often overexpose the image to compensate for the fact that I think Apple is purposely underexposing images too much. But that's where this is found. The timer, the timer comes in handy if um, it's the, the closest thing you'll get to a tripod if you don't have a tripod, right? Rather than clicking on the shutter, if I'm shooting a selfie like this, I will turn on the uh, timer, click on it, and that way I don't have to worry about doing any kind of finger yoga with holding the camera and then shooting at the same time. So the timer is actually is a very nice feature and it's either three or 10 seconds. These are your filters. Again, I don't recommend shooting with them. Um, it's, it's a real fun experiment. If you want to shoot, you know, take one day and only shoot black and white, only see the world in black and white, it's great. Knowing that everything that you shoot in the native camera, it is non-destructive. You can go back and undo anything that you shot in black and white, and it will um, automatically turn it back into color or any other fil filter that you'd like. So they're useful. I just wouldn't use them as a default. <laughs> And uh, so let me, I'm going to, I'm going to pan through this here because we went through this. So um, there is the live photo that I was talking about. So turning that off, there's your exposure compensation where you have a slider so you can up it or down it. Again, for my purposes, when shooting raw, I will purposely overexpose a full stop, especially when I'm in a challenge light situation like nighttime or infrared. Um, here's my exposure compensation. And then there is our timer. There is shooting with the filter. So that's turning on one of the black and whites, the monos, you can see that down there. The noir is a very nice black and white filter. It's as close as you're gonna to get to a infrared shot without really shooting infrared. Again, but I don't typically have those turned on. And the exposure, we're talking about raw there. And then zoom, I'm just gonna loop this here. Um, the zoom on the phone, you can just tap on these numeric values down here. That's your ultra wide, wide and telephoto. You'll see that the telephoto on the new iPhone 12 Pro Max, <coughs> excuse me, is 2.5, not two. Again, this is a 13, 26, and 65 millimeter lens. But you also have digital zoom at your disposal. And if you literally just go inside the frame and pinch open, it will automatically start the digital zoom. And that will go up to 12 megapic, 12x on the um, 12 Pro Max or 10x on any other iPhone okay, that has the telephoto lens built into it. So um, your telephoto is typically a pinch or zoom. If you're doing video, you can actually do a slide left or right to do a smoother zoom in onto a scene. 
Okay, but typically the zoom is press and uh, is just doing a pin. I'm gonna say in a second. And half so after that you audio is just is just hideous. And then the other there is our digital zoom, so you can see I'm just pinching in, and now I'm at a two x. Here's that little live photo. We'll we'll talk on this, especially next week, when we're going to talk about how you can take once you've shot something you can then ask it to become this long exposure where everything, all the rocks are razor sharp, but the water is a three second long exposure. Okay. And then the last thing related to doing um, exposure is you probably know that if you tap anywhere on the screen on the iPhone, it sets both focus and exposure. You tap on a light area, it will darken it up and set the focus there. If you tap on a dark area, it'll brighten it up, brighten everything up and set the exposure there. Um, the thing is, what if you want to, and I'm gonna see if I can do this here while pointing at my laptop, which is gonna be some really weird psychedelic effect here. So if I'm shooting videos, if I tap anywhere, you'll see a square and it's now exposing for the light portion. If I click out here, it's now exposing for the gray. You'll notice that when I click, I also have a little teeny sun to the right hand of that square. If I click here and then go up or down, I can manually set the exposure to whatever I would like. Okay, this is typically how most people would set um, focused and exposure, not using the little um, exposure compensation thing that came in with iOS 14. You simply click where you want the thing, let's say uh, the sunset, and then stroke your finger up or down to get the appropriate exposure. If you want to separate out the focus location from the exposure, you can actually, if I say I want the center, I can press and hold and you'll notice you get auto exposure, auto focus lock, just like you would on your big boy or big girl camera. And you still have that little teeny sun to the side. So now I can set the exposure. So if I want, I can set tapping somewhere on the foreground to set that as the focus point, press and hold until it locks. And then I just drag up and down until I get the appropriate exposure. You're not locked into clicking on one area and only having that being the both the focus and the exposure. How did I do that again? You tap where you'd like it to focus, tap and hold until you get the A, E, A, F lock, and then stroke your finger up or down in order to fine tune your exposure. Make sense? Nod your head enthusiastically. Where does this come in handy? And we're gonna jump over to another shooting mode now and that is panoramas, where you have different exposures. You're shooting again, the proverbial sunset, where you start over here, you're 180 degrees away from, or 90 degrees away from your primary light source. If you start over here with a pano, by the time you get to the sun, it's completely blown out, right? You've all done that, and then you continue on. So this auto exposure, auto focus lock comes in handy because you'll go over here, set it in the center, press and hold, lock it onto the sunset, and then you recompose your panorama and start from the left and move over to the right. That way it'll be dark where the scene is naturally dark and you'll have a correct exposure for something like the center portion of a panorama. I've got another video on that, which I think has got um, better audio. So let's um, talk about that. But I wanted to talk about your focus and exposure tapping is your focus up and down is your exposure, press and hold is your um, focus lock. Okay, makes sense? Okay, let's see what this next one is. Jack here with a few tips and techniques on shooting portraits with the iPhone. Specifically, I'm working on the uh, iPhone 12 Pro Max right now. And the, uh, I'll just start off with that in terms of the hardware change is the nice thing about the Pro Max iPhone 12, is that it has a 65 instead of a 55 millimeter uh, portrait lens. The front um, 
facing camera, not the rear facing, not the one that I'm using right now to record, is actually a 65, what they call a two and a half time zoom rather than a two time zoom. And that, as you know, when shooting portraits is nicer because it flattens the face. This front facing camera is more of a wide angle and you're gonna get you know a wider face, which usually is not flattering, but we'll see that. So I'm gonna do right now a couple shots using this front facing camera, just exactly like I'm doing right now and take some pictures. But I'll also use the uh, front facing camera and you'll see the difference in terms of the uh, telephoto aspect. I had that backwards. The front facing of, is your um, selfie camera, camera, rear facing. Let's go through a few of the features that are here right now on the interface. Starting in the upper left, we have our flash. We press and hold on that. It'll bring up the options down at the bottom. You'll notice that triangle at the top. That triangle kind of brings up this tray of options along the bottom, and one of those is flash. And then, of course, um, here we have no need for flash in terms of a nighttime mode or nighttime scene. But um, if you're familiar with, with backlight, which I have now, which is a lot more flattering than front. So again, for time purposes, I'm just going to speed through this. Um, that's that fill flash that I mentioned on portraits. The other thing that you have at your disposal when um, shooting portraits are these different studio light modes. And you've got a the natural light. And let's see. I don't want to talk about that. So the second one over studio light is automatically going to find the faces and brighten them up. It's a really nice um, instant fix for portraits. That's my default setting. Because my um, settings are set, set to preserve settings, it will keep that. It will keep that um, studio light mode, which is more flattering for portraits, even though that's not a flattering portrait at all. The same thing goes with, as soon as you're in portrait mode, your um, faux f-stop, right? This is the apparent f-stop. And this right here um, will also stay consistent. A nice um, depth of field for most portraits, a 5.6 is nice without getting too greedy. Let's get it. Brighten up the faces. And so, um, and so the um, 5.6, I think is a good way to go. When you get into the 1.8, things like that, you're asking an awful lot for it to, in terms of edge detection. This is a preview right here, because I'm shooting video. So this isn't what the final quality is, but um, something to keep in mind uh, in terms of um, how much, how greedy you want to get in terms of the f-stop. You can change anything after the fact. So you can change your um, studio lighting mode, you can change your f-stop, and at the top of the um, scene, you can even once you're looking at a picture that you've already taken, you can go ahead and turn off portrait. You'll see at the top of an image when you hit edit, it'll say portrait. It'll be yellow just like this. You click on it and you'll be turning off portrait mode and your background will now be razor sharp. So when you're shooting in this portrait mode, um, you have the ability to change any of these variables, the lighting, the f-stop, and even whether you're using this mode whatsoever. There are some very creative uh, modes in terms of here, like this high key um, light mode or the background contour light, the stage light mono, um, all sorts of things that you can do in terms of that. Um, the thing that I wanted to mention, though, is um, that if you can use the um, back facing, the rear facing camera, because it's going to be um, less distorting than the front facing camera. But whatever you, whatever you need to get the job done. Okay. And there we go. Two more uh, shooting options here on the iPhone. Specifically, we're going to jump over to Pano. So here again, I'll do that same thing. I'll give you a couple tips on where um, the Pano one. When you jump into Pano mode, you're used to this arrow that's going left to right or right to left. If you tap on the arrow, arrow, it will automatically swap it. You don't. You're not forced with shooting left to right constantly. You can shoot from right to left. 
or left to right or top to bottom. You can shoot um, up and down by simply rotating the camera and then now do this to shoot a vertical pano if I wanted to shoot up a tree or up a building or anything, okay? So that arrow will now be pointing up and down when I rotate my camera. The default of being in portrait mode, you're gonna be left to right, okay? So you can swap it. Why would you swap left to right or right to left? You're gonna typically start with the lightest portion of your exposure. Again, if you've got that proverbial sunset, you want to ex have it exposed correctly for the primary subject in your scene, and then you move left or right. Remembering that if it's not the far left or far right, just move the camera where your subject is, press and hold until you get that auto exposure lock, recompose, and then take your pan out. Okay. The other tip that's in this one here related to panos is that if you have, um, typically, if you're shooting a pano and you don't have something close in the foreground, you can do this, where you're gonna bring your elbows in close to your chest and you're gonna rotate around your torso, right? That's gonna be your most stable way of shooting a pano. The problem is, is that's not the best way to shoot a pano because this vantage point where my lens is is completely different from where my lens and camera is here. They're shooting from two completely different angles. A, a good traditional panorama is gonna have a rotation around what's known as the nodal point, the nodal point. And that's gonna be, technically it's the sensor, but you could say it's the lens. So if you're shooting something that's close up, that's not at a distance, let's say the um, branch of this tree that's close up, well, let's say you're shooting people where you can't have any distortion of the people in the scene. How do you shoot that? How do you rotate the phone around the nodal point? The way to do that is I would just rest your finger, rest your finger right above the lens, okay? Set it up where you'd like it, press the start shutter, and then you just rotate it like this. That way you're gonna get no distortion on the people in your scene or it could be a, a, a sushi roll. You're in a restaurant and you want to do a panorama, which you can do, which is really cool. Panorama of this nice big sushi roll, but you don't want the exaggerated distortion. Then you just come up here, set it, hit the shutter release, rotate around that nodal point. And now what do I do to stop the pano? Okay, especially if I've gone like this and I can't even see the bloody shutter button. Remember that these iPhones have gyroscopes built, gyroscopes built into them. You don't have to press the shutter to stop a pano. You just rotate it the opposite direction and it'll automatically stop it. You do have to start the pano, click, rotate it, and then just go back ever so slightly and it'll automatically stop the pano. Okay? A lot of information there as well, but very, very cool. Remember vertical panos as well as horizontal. Remember you can tap the arrow to change the direction of the initial start of the pano. And remember you can also lock the exposure related to a pano to make sure that your subject matter is exposed correctly. And remember you don't have to tap the shutter to stop a pano. Okay, all you need to do is rotate the opposite direction. Okay. And our last settings here on the left-hand side of the bottom, of course, our video. And this is, uh, this really, the, the topic isn't video here, but just remember that you do, um, let's just tip, you do have, there's our pano. And our last settings. That you do have um, these really cool video options here. In the upper right hand corner is where you can change the video, the resolution from 4K to high def, 60 frame per second, 30 frame per second. Remember, I mentioned that one of the benefits of shooting 4K video is that every frame is an 8 pixel file. So again, very, very cool from that standpoint. Um, slow motion is very cool as well. That'll go up to 240 frames. That's limited limited to what's known as 1080 video. 
traditional high def, something you probably wouldn't use for um, doing any prints from. And then the um, other thing is time lapse. And if you haven't played around with time lapse, I showed some samples to begin with. Very cool. And remember that on the iPhone 12s, you now have night mode time lapse, which will be very cool for those of you living in the desert or out in the middle of the ocean. Okay, and for this, this last one, which actually is a pretty... Last but not least, let's do some night mode, specifically infrared night mode. In this case, Since we've teased on this, this I'm going to show Max, this one here. And I have got it clipped onto the front face, the uh, rear facing camera, my infrared filter that I showed you just a second ago. I'm looking at the selfie camera, so we're seeing it in full color. As I swap it, there is the scene that's in front of me. Let's go ahead and just swap that around so you can see what we've got going on here. There's the scene that we're going to shoot in infrared through this 720 nanometer filter. And so as I swap it around, I can, if I was on a, a 12 or 11 or anything else that's not shooting in Apple Pro Raw, the upper left-hand corner of the screen, you can see that I've got raw as an option. We'll talk about how to turn that on for one of the 12 Pros, which I'm gonna do now. And now I'm shooting in the uh, Apple Pro Raw file format. That will allow me to maintain my uh, deep fusion and smart HDR capabilities. I mentioned before, in terms of exposure, I certainly can just simply come over here and you'll notice in the upper, what would be now the lower left-hand corner, there's my night mode. So I'm gonna click on night mode and I'm gonna come up here. And even though it says it doesn't need night mode, it's so bright, it's actually allowing me to handhold this. I'm going to um, ask it to shoot it as if it's night mode, as if it was a dark night scene that will help with the noise and detail. So uh, if I come up here, I can press the shutter. It builds that up. As I've mentioned, I like um, setting my exposure a little hotter. So by clicking on that little tray at the top, there's my little plus. If you look in these options down here, there's my night mode. I'm going to click on this. Set my night mode. Actually setting my exposure right now to a full plus one stop over. And it's going to maintain all that wonderful shadow detail and yet give me a better pop to my highlights. The, um, night mode, as you can see in the, what will be your lower left-hand corner, still set at one second. I'm in the exposure compensation area and I'm going to press and shoot another shot. Okay. And that'll be what I'm going to do now. I'm going to also turn off raw go back to my exposure compensation, no compensation here. Press it, there will be no raw on this one. And again, I'm gonna do an overexposure of one full stop. Night mode, if you want to, if you're shooting something, let's walk over here to darker scene. Okay, and so that is there and I mentioned the filter setup, so let me just show that to you here. I had it. So that's what it, the infrared filter is. It's a black piece of glass that you're photographing through that's only allowing this, um, just the edge of visible light in. You, as you go from uh, ultraviolet to violet through the full color spectrum to red to infrared, this is the one that's blocking everything but infrared. And then what I did is how am I getting that attached is this is a moment case that uses a bayonet mount to apply different um, lenses on top of an iPhone. In this case, I'm using it in concert with another little um, device. This one right here known as the Moondog Labs um, filter adapter. And it just literally takes that little teeny, there's a little bayonet mount and then that goes on top of the moment case. And then you screw on, in this case, a 52 millimeter, 720 nanometer, that's how you measure infrared filters, is the wavelength that it captures. In this case, 720 is a standard 
infrared um, wavelength. And um, there, then you're able to um, use all your lenses and shoot the image in infrared. Okay. Um, and the same thing goes if you're just shooting regular night mode with that. Um, it allows you up to three seconds handheld and does a great job with that. The iPhone knows if you're on a tripod and will let you shoot um, up to 10 seconds in night mode. And every single one of those, it'll take advantage of that, of that time, shoot multiple exposures, blend them all together, use it to get rid of noise and exaggerate detail in the file. They are freakishly, amazingly good if you have not um, been shooting in night mode. And I find it not only for night images, but for infrared, it's what allows me to shoot um, files and um, handheld photos um, Handheld photos, this is what we were just looking at, um, just beautifully in a non-converted camera. For those of you who have shot converted infrared, the ability to just have a filter in your pocket while you're out traveling and be able to shoot infrared is uh, just amazing, freakishly cool. Okay, so we got a little bit of a late start here. Um, I'm not going to get into um, Lightroom shooting. I'm gonna save that. Um, for next week, that's one of the great things about having two weeks is uh, when we get into processing where I was going to be talking uh, more at length about Lightroom, we'll start off that portion of talking about shooting with the different uh, modes within um, Lightroom Mobile. And um, just to give you a little teaser of uh, when we're going to be talking about um, different apps uh, talking about this artificial intelligence and machine learning, for those of you who haven't played with apps like Faces that can let you go from this to this, uh, basically instantaneously with no retouching, okay? Or from this to this. <laughs> I needed some laughter. I needed some frivolity at the end of a very <laughs> long, geeky night. <laughs> yes. Good. This, this is more or less where I'm looking right now. Um, but it is, or this, this is a little bit more subtle. This is actually from that session. And uh, this one, it's pulling in the nose. It's getting rid of the center distortion. It's automatically popping the eyes and teeth. It's helping a little bit with the circles under the eyes. Normally, none of you would ever do this for yourself, but clients will pay big bucks for this sort of thing. Anyway, this is an app um, called Faces we're gonna touch on. It's again, relates to this machine learning. This one is a app called uh, Remini and it is freakishly good at bringing back resolution to older files. Um, the most beautiful parents in the world, they a standard old, you know, uh, four by six print from a million years ago that is the exact same photograph done through software. And if you've ever tried to do this in Photoshop, you know that is pure witchcraft. To go from that to that is not possible. Certainly not in a free app. You've got to watch a stupid 30 second cartoon. You can pay for it as a subscription but even the, the free app version of this is amazing. Again, the two most beautiful children in the world. To bring back that much detail from a little four by six. Yeah, there's a really cute young man there. And to bring in that much detail on an image that's over 50 years old is just freakishly amazing. So we're going to talk on uh, talk about that because that's the topic is this uh, machine learning artificial intelligence. And let's see if we've got another one here. I do a lot of uh, digital painting. 
And this is a app called uh, DreamScope. And you can tell it, use this piece of art, apply it to this photograph, and you can get just the most amazing different variations on works of art um, that you've ever seen. There's really nothing that comes close. You can give it some chrome and it'll turn it into chrome. There's some, some cloisonne, comic books, woodcuts, traditional impasto. I mean, it's just, it's, it's wrong in every possible way with how uh, this, an embroidery that's now embroidered. So anyway, on the topic of um, artificial intelligence, uh, computational photography, both shooting as well as in post-processing. Next week, we're gonna be emphasizing post, um, but we'll do a little bit more shooting as well. So I could keep going, but this is a kind of a, an overview um, class. Like I said, uh, Karen and I have been trying to get together and, and do some sort of thing together for uh, some time. So I'm glad that I could get uh, two weeks to be able to play with you all on this. Uh, I am doing working on a, a three day course what would be the equivalent of, of three different courses related to um, shooting, enhancing and special effects, um, including the infrared photography. That's going to be a class that's going to be coming out soon. Um, I'm recording that with Rad Drew, a, another phenomenal uh, mobile photography instructor. And uh, we'll be doing that together and we'll make sure and do a super deep uh, discount for you all in Chicago related to that. Um, also, uh, Karen and I have been talking about doing a, another full day um, seminar, um, Zoom meeting with you all, probably geared more to uh, traditional workflow, um, desktop, Photoshop, Lightroom, and the synchronizing of things like uh, mobile Lightroom and mobile Photoshop. Photoshop for iPad is phenomenal if you haven't played with it and how those all sync together. So that would be, you know, a, uh, a four pay full day workshop uh, Zoom meeting as well. So we've got a number of things coming up, but we'll continue on with next week. Um, Karen, I don't know if you think that there, you have another minute. I know it's real late back East for you all. I'm happy to answer some more questions or whatever you would like. I think it would be great to answer some more questions. Uh, we, we have a, a few in the chat um, somebody okay. wanted you to repeat the name of the, um, the, the piece that the filter goes on for the infrared. Uh, Moondog. Moondog Labs is the, uh, and I've got the uh, picture of it. Let's see. Moondog Labs is what uh, goes on to it. Uh, let's see if I can find that here. I had the specific, I'm sure I've got it here. Uh, well, this is the one I, the moment case right now is just coming out for the iPhone 12s. And the Moondog Lab one is not yet available for the um, iPhone 12. So it's, it, it's in the midst of coming out. This is another adapter that you can see. It has a little teeny screw mount that you can put onto any um, iPhone. And this one is called um, U-Filter Adapter. Again, this is a 62 millimeter. And then you just um, screw on whatever filter you'd want to put in front of the iPhone. So this happens to be my um, 62 millimeter infrared. The other one, which is better because of the bayonet mount is a more form fitting um, on the Moondog Labs adapter um, is what I recommend, but I don't have an example uh, of that except for, actually, I've got it right here. This is for the iPhone 11. So the, let's see if I can get that to show up. So it is, a filter adapter. So there is my infrared filter. 
and there is the adapter. And if I take that off, here's that little teeny adapter. Again, Moondog Labs. This is for a 52 millimeter filter, which is easy to find infrareds for. And again, this is the uh, moment case that has the different bayonet mounts on it. But this one simply comes on there, screws on there, you put on your infrared filter and you're good to go. And I'll, I'll put together a list um, for next week when I know what I'm able to cover. Um, I will put a uh, together a list of all kind of the uh, recommended products. Um, and I will have that as part of uh, next week's class. Okay. It would be great. Yeah. And um, again, speaking of, there's the uh, filter, some of the ones, there's that face app that did the hair, there's Remini, there's DreamScope, the painting. We're going to touch on Touch Retouch, which is a phenomenal retouching tool. And uh, we'll touch on both Snapseed and Lightroom next week for editing as well. And again, this is our outline from um, tonight if you wanted to do a screenshot um, of that. Okay. Um, we had another question from uh, Marty Bone. Um, he's asked. Uh, he, he didn't see anything above one second on night mode. Uh, he was asking, where is the three second that you showed? So uh, we'll see what we can do with this based upon our limited thing here. <clears throat> so as an example, um, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, you see that looks like a kind of a moon, crescent moon with stripes on it. So right now, it, there's plenty of light and night mode will not go on, but it's just on the border where I can force it to go on. If I hold it up to something really bright, you'll see there that little icon in the upper left disappeared. I cannot put do night mode in this mode no matter what. Okay, it has to be darker and then you click on, if it's really dark, it'll automatically turn yellow, meaning it's, yeah, dude, you need night mode. But right now I'm in that in-between zone. I can click on it. And when I click on it, it comes up at the bottom where it says auto. And again, auto here is saying you don't need it. But if I slide my finger to the left or from left toward the right, you'll notice that that icon now becomes yellow. I have turned on night mode. And now in the upper left-hand corner, it says one second. That's the most that I can do in this current light situation, especially handheld. If I want to turn off, I can slide it back over here and there is no night mode. So one, you have to be in a dark setting. And then two, if you are in a dark setting, you can, but it's not turning on, it's not automatically um, going yellow, you can click on it and then slide it over. And if you push it all the way over, it'll maximize whatever that length of time is. If you are not on a tripod, it'll max out at three seconds. If it knows there's no movement, if the gyroscope knows there's no movement, you can move that over to up to 10 seconds, which is great. Okay. And somebody wanted to know, Pamela wanted to know, um, can you use an R72? infrared filter on the iPhone 11 Pro? Uh, an R72. Sometimes they take off the hundred, so a 720 nanometer uh, could be known as an R72. Um, so I'm not quite sure. You can put anything on there, um, depending upon if you get up to higher nanometers, like a 960, that's really cutting off almost all light altogether. And then you're going to take that night mode probably up to that 10 second. So you, and, but it'll be a richer contrast, higher contrast. Anything below 720 is going to be what's known as more of a super color infrared. Then you're going to be getting sepias and cyans. You won't have that high contrast. So it really depends upon what nanometer flavor you want for your infrared. 720 is a good medium ground 
where it gives you the high contrast and yet it still allows enough light that you're not uh, forced into a tripod situation. Okay. And um, we have a couple more hands raised. Joseph Norton, do you want to ask your question? Sure, thank you very much. Jack, I just a quick question. Could you repeat the name of the backup uh, application you mentioned earlier? I said amazing I'm, or iMazing? One word, iMazing. It's a desktop app um, specifically for the Mac. I think it's like 29 bucks, maybe 34 bucks, but it is uh, the ro most robust uh, backup as well as just every single thing that's on your phone, every song, every text message, every voice um, note that you've taken, all your notes, everything is available um, in batch or individually. Um, okay. They've really done a great job as well as it's an automated uh, backup system as well. So it can automatically uh, do it and it can do it through Wi-Fi as well. So you can have it, you know, back up on a regular basis via Wi-Fi and it's automatically going to your, uh, to your desktop. Excellent, thank you very much. You're welcome. Outstanding, outstanding. Now I have to become an iPhone photographer. <laughs> it's pretty gosh darn fun. I gotta say, hopefully the, the, the one thing you've come across this presentation, aside from the fact that, that it's way geeky and a lot of detail, is we're stuck with these for the rest of our lives. We will be shooting these. We'll, there's no way we're gonna get away from that. And just as with all our other tools, like our DSLRs, if, unless we know our camera and its settings and the lenses and how those all work together, we obviously won't be able to push them as far as they can in terms of our storytelling. So something as simple as understanding how the pano works or how to set the exposure or the fact that in live photo, you can go, let's just, you know, go to that live photo. And again, we'll get into this um, next week, but if we go into live photo and here's from today, that little shoot, if you flick up on a live photo, this is where you can automatically choose a loop or just simply click on long exposure. And now I've got handheld, no tripod, a complete razor sharp three second exposure that is literally impossible to do with any sort of camera setup, especially considering I could be looking directly into the sun taking this picture. Like if I'm shooting waves on, a, on the shoreline as you saw on some other ones with no ND because it's not actually leaving the lens open, the shutter open for three seconds, it's doing stuff that is physically impossible optically. It's doing it because of pure computational witchcraft. So hopefully what you got out of this class tonight is even if you didn't, I'm sure you didn't pick up everything that we talked about, but if you go, okay, there's enough stuff here for me to dig into that will add to my capabilities as a storyteller as a photographer, as an art creator. All tools are simply meant to serve us in making beautiful things that make the world a better place. So uh, from my standpoint, the tools as they currently stand are incredibly exciting. And, uh, and I'm, I feel privileged to be, you know, a photographer this time in the history of the planet. I'll mention specifically one of the topics, normally a question would come up was what about uh, prints? How big can you print these things? Come on, let's be serious. You know, these are stupid little iPhones. Um, we'll also talk about next week things like um, Topaz AI Gigapixel. Um, it's similar to that uh, Remini, that app that I showed you that actually increases resolution from old photographs, total science fiction stuff. Uh, Topaz's AI Gigapixel allows you to blow things up to 600% and maintain ridiculous amounts of detail because of AI and machine learning. Um, it's not sharpening up. If you've got a brick building, it doesn't sharpen up the brick building. It says, those are bricks. I know what bricks look like at high resolution and recreates the bricks to match perfectly at high resolution. So the limitations of these little pocket cameras, whether it's a shallow depth of field, long exposures, resolution, zoom telephoto, wide angle. We're at a really, really cool place in photography now with these devices. So again, my privilege to be able to do this tonight. 
and I'm glad we've got a follow up to uh, to continue on with it. It'll be more fun because we'll be doing you know tweaking and and doing workflow. I'll go through my Lightroom workflow using Lightroom Mobile, which is the same as an Adobe Camera Raw workflow. So we'll we'll have a great great time um, next week as well. Jack, we have a couple more questions. Sure. Uh, Absolutely. Okay. Um, let's see. I well, somebody must must have taken her hands down, hand down. Okay. Um, let's see. Sarah McKinstry, uh, did you want to uh, ask a question? Yeah, I just wanted to know. So, what kind of um, iPhone case? Will the adapters, the, the Moon Dogs Lab and stuff, what's the best iPhone case to get that would? Um... The Moment. So Moment is a company that makes a, a series of cases and actually lens adapters. <coughs> Excuse me. So as an example, this Moment uh, case right here is the Moment case. I can screw on a telephoto, a fisheye, a wide angle, an anamorphic, all sorts of, because of the, the bayonet mounts built into the uh, moment case, you can actually apply different pieces of glass. I'm not using it for that. I want to actually just have a, a filter holder that does a really good job of getting out any corrupting light around the edge. And so that's where the a different company, moment doesn't make a filter adapter um, that just goes right onto its case. And that's where the moon dog labs okay comes in. If you're interested in it, if you have an iPhone 11 or before, they've got the Moondog Lab adapters. If you have a 12, then uh, make sure that you're ordering a 12 or pre-ordering the 12 because they're not shipping those yet. So I love the Moment case. Uh, I think they're great. They allow you to extend it, right? you know, add telephotos. It keeps, yeah, it keeps your, your phone safe. Like if you drop it, it's like a good it is, it's an excellent one. It's actually is, is real wood. Let's see if I can get that on there. So oh, awesome. the one I like has got uh, a real wooden uh, bottom to it. I've put on a pop socket. You can do all sorts of things with it. Um, but yes, there's a number of different moment cases and any of those would work great with the Moondog Labs adapter. There are other ways of doing it. You can use um, clip on ones. This is that one that I mentioned that I'm using currently on my 12. And that's that one that I showed you the picture of um, that screws on. It's not as good as the moment one, but again, that was the one that I mentioned um, known as U hyphen filter. You can get that on Amazon. And uh, I'll try and do links for all of those for the next class. So you have specific um, brand names and maybe even links to all of them on Amazon. Okay, does anybody else have a question for Jack? Question, a quick one. Uh, I, okay, I, Jack, I, I realized that probably last week after like 60 years of photography, that it's not a good idea to fry food in your kitchen with your cameras on the table, just oh. because of like volatile oils and stuff going in the yeah. airs. Um, do, do you have any do's or don'ts for like cleaning your lens on your iPhone? Well, they're, they're actually, they're, the, these, especially the new ones, these are ridiculously indestructible. The glass on these now is um, is just amazing. Their their level of um, protection in terms of the overall glass on the device is uh, second to none. So I wouldn't recommend even using a protective shield on the front. No reason to put anything on there. It's it won't be as strong, and your likelihood of breaking your your front lens. In terms of these, these are all coated in a synthetic sapphire, all these lenses. They're again, ridiculously strong in terms of that and um, not susceptible to scratches. I wouldn't put it into my pocket with keys just for fun. I doubt you could even scratch it if you wanted to. Um, all cases are gonna have a rim that is gonna make it so you can lay down uh, any case and not have it actually touch the glass. Uh, make sure you do. I've never seen a case, there's no reason a case would ever come that doesn't have a protective lip to make sure that you, when you lay it down, you're not touching anything. Same thing goes with this one, you know, the, you've, you've always got a lip on all of them. So uh, from that standpoint, um, 
And in terms of a regular lens cleaning cloth, you know, just a microfiber um, is going to be fine. And I wouldn't worry about them. Again, literally the synthetic sapphire on these, as well as the um, uh, glass on the main um, screen is ridiculously strong. And uh, Joe yeah. Cressman asked, um, have you played with an anamorphic lens for stills? For stills, no. I, I've only used the anamorphic for video when you're when you're trying to shoot in a traditional letterbox um, scenario. Um, I'm sure there are benefits to using an anamorphic on um, still images. I do use some of the moment filters for the fish fisheye. Um, they've got a very nice um, linear fisheye with very little distortion on it. So when you really do need a, a hyper, you know, kind of fisheye and a panorama isn't doing it. Um, there is some, um, great. So this is with the uh, moment um, fisheye that's added to it. So I do use specialty filters, um, but uh, I have not used the anamorphic for still images. Okay. Do you use the regular flash on the iPhone or just the uh, fill flash? Um, oh yeah, I use it. The, the flash at night is great. It's, it is um, extremely well balanced. As you know, it's a two-part flash. Uh, it's a multi-color flash. So it is automatically reading the scene and changing the white balance of the flash based upon the scene. Um, and it is a variable flash. So it knows how far the subject is away from the uh, camera. So it will change the throughput of the flash based upon distance. So it's incredibly intelligent. Um, do I want to shoot a flash ever for a portrait at night? No, but if you need to, it's a great flash. Um, normally I would want something off to the side. So I'm getting some side light and modeling, not a you know, deer in the headlights straight on. So I actually will typically just use the, um, the flash, that forced fill flash for uh, daytime portraits. Um, that's really what, um, what I love it for. So is there a flash that you can use uh, that syncs with the, uh, an off camera flash? that syncs with the phone? Um, yeah, any, any, any flash that's triggered by an existing flash, a slave flash, um, you can use. Again, the, the speed of light is such that you can trigger a flash and have an external flash and it'll still be captured during the exposure. Um, there are Bluetooth flashes that will work as an offsite and it is communicating wirelessly via Bluetooth to trigger a uh, off-camera flash. So yes, there are ones um, that you certainly can do. Okay. Or you could do kind of like what I've got here. I've got, you know, two big uh, uh, fluorescent lights, you know, all on. So that's typically what I'd be doing. If I do need augmented light, I'm going to be using uh, uh, always on, you know, fluorescent uh, color temperature variable. And, you know, then I see exactly what I'm shooting. So that's typically, I'm, I'm not a big, strobe person. Right. Okay. Well, we hope uh, everybody will come back next week for part hope I didn't scare you off. Sorry about that. What was that? Hope I didn't scare anybody off by <laughs> I don't Does my phone even need me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's where the story comes in. Everything else is just, you know, Chrome letters. It's it's you know without a person there to to know what to look at and when to press the button, uh, it's it's all meaningless. Um, but it's pretty gosh darn cool when you've got this much power at your fingertips to be able to tell stories. It's pretty darn cool. All right. Well, I'm especially interested in learning about DreamScope, um, so I'm hoping you'll devote some time to that next week. Yeah. Um, so in case you can't make it next week, please check our calendar uh, on our website 
for future events. Um, in February, we have Deborah Loeb Boren, who is going to be talking about travel photography and using abstracts in your travel photography. So it's the science and art of abstracts. So that should be interesting. And she um, does multiple exposures and long exposures in her photography. Um, so Jack, did you want to add anything before? Well, we I think I've spoken more than enough. Thank you guys for your attention and uh, look forward to seeing you all next week. And uh, sometime in the spring, we'll do it again with something more geared toward uh, uh, a little bit more desktop. But till then, we'll see you on Friday. And I'll make sure and have uh, more resources in terms of uh, things that have been used, um, some notes and uh, some more stuff, as well as more information on that. I only do one live event every year myself, which is over on the island of Molokai with two National Geographic photographers, Dwight Jones and Ricky Cook. Um, that's will be next November, and uh, I'm taking you know reservations for that very very limited number. So I'll give you more information about that. You'll you'll get my snake oil sales pitch, but we'll save that for next week. <laughs> okay. Well, thank, thank you, you very much, and thank you all for coming. And hopefully, we'll see you all next week. Yay. All right, thank, you. Thank, you. Bye. thank you. Thank you. Take care. Okay. okay. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Karen, uh, give me a call later, okay? I'll okay. call you later.